All right, if you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible. Uh, you who have been here, who have not been sick or out of town or something, you know that we've gone through chapter one, we've got started into part of chapter two. Now, Revelation is a, a book that a lot of people shy away from because uh, they don't understand it. It's hard to understand. Now, Satan hates the book of Revelation. He hates two books, as we said before. Satan hates the book of Genesis because it kind of tells, tells us what he did to drag the whole human race down into sin. So he hates that book. And it also shares in the book of Genesis that uh, God was going to provide a redeemer, uh, a Messiah who would bruise Satan's head, but Satan would just bruise his heel, talking about a prophecy of Christ dying on the cross. So Satan hates the book of Genesis. And then he hates the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation uh, lets us know just exactly what he's really like and what's going to happen to him in the end. So we live in a time, if you watch TV, you see all the different things that are happening around the world with COVID-19 and all kinds of stuff and so much political corruption and everybody's thinking what's going on, the whole world's going crazy. Everybody feels like something major is about to happen. Well, the book of Revelation actually tells us what's going to happen. So we're, we're going through the book of Revelation chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We've already covered chapter 1. It says that God gave the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ did, to John, who was exiled on the island of Patmos. Out of the Aegean Sea, he was exiled by the Roman government because they got sick of him preaching the gospel. They threw him on this old island and they thought, well, that'll shut you up. Well, God was saying, I'm not through with you, John. So God started to give him the book of Revelation. What's going to happen in the future? Now, in chapter 1, he talks about primarily showing us a vision of Jesus Christ in his full glory. Jesus Christ was not just the Son of God in the sense that He's a little bit less than the Father. Jesus Christ was not someone who became the Son of God when He was born to Mary uh, miraculously and then uh, died on the cross. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. So I want to just cover some of those verses that we've covered many times that talk about Jesus Christ being God. Now, in Isaiah chapter, six, uh, chapter 7, it says, A virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will name him, his name, Emmanuel. Now, Emmanuel, the meaning of the, the name Emmanuel is God with us. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. And then when we go over to Isaiah chapter 9, there's another prophecy of Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will uh, rest upon his shoulder. He's going to have ultimate authority. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So here's a little boy born to a virgin whose name is Emmanuel, which is, means God with us. And over here, his names, he has other names. He's called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. So Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. How can he be the Son and also be the Father at the same time? I don't know. There's one God, but there are three persons of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I don't understand how that all fits together because in some places the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. And here, Jesus Christ, one of his names is the mighty, uh, the everlasting Father. And so it's really confusing to me, but at the same time, I know there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but there's still one God. Now, I want us to go over to John chapter 1, and he talks again about Jesus Christ in chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. What is the Word? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the, and the Word was God. So now the Word was with God, and at the same time, the Word is called God. 
He was in the beginning with God. Now the word is called He. Then it says, all things were made through Him, were created through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. So the Word, it says the Word was in the beginning. The Word was with God. Then it says the Word was God. Now it says, all things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. So the Word is now credited with being the creator of the universe. Then you go over to verse 14 of the same chapter, and it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ in John chapter 1 is credited with being the creator of the universe. Let's go over to Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 14. I'm going to start at actually the end. Oh, I'll start at verse 14. Talking about Jesus Christ. In whom we have redemption. If you're saved, you're redeemed. He purchased you from the slave market of sin with His own blood. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. So he's talking about Jesus Christ. But then it says, He, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God. If you want to see what God the Father or God's like, look at Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about appearance. I'm talking about how He is. He's the firstborn of, over all creation. That means in the Jewish household, the firstborn got twice the inheritance of all the other kids. Well, He's the firstborn of all creation. God has given us, if you're a Christian, God's given you everything He can possibly give you, except you will never be God. You're adopted into God's family. If you're a Christian, God says your salvation's so secure, He views you as if you're already seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And so he says you can call God the Father, Abba, which is the Aramaic term which the common people spoke. The, the, the word Abba means not Father, it means Daddy. It's the familiar form of Father. So if you're a Christian, you're adopted into God's family, you can call Him Daddy. And it says that you're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Uh, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians says that you're an ambassador of heaven. In the book of Hebrews, it says Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call you brothers or sisters. God's given you everything in Christ that He could possibly give you, except you will not be God. And so Jesus Christ is the firstborn over all creation. Now I want us to go to Hebrews chapter 1. And he, I'm not going to cover all the things that talk about Christ being God, but Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 1, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets in the Old Testament. He has in these last days spoken to us by His Son. God has spoken to us about Himself through His Son. Then it says, whom He has appointed heir of all things and through whom He made the worlds. God the Father gave Jesus Christ that responsibility to create the universe. So when you have Jesus Christ walking down the road and John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, every Jew knew what he was talking about because of the Passover Lamb in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is our Passover Lamb who takes away the sin of every person who ever trusts in Him as their Lord and Savior because Christ was God in the flesh. Now, when we go back to Revelation, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, there's a, a letter given to John by Jesus Christ, and it's to seven churches. Now, if you look in your bulletin, you will see that I have a little handout, and it has seven churches of Revelation. On the top part, it talks about how each church was a literal church, but each church also the different characteristics of each individual church was a picture of a particular time in church history. Now, people back then didn't understand that because church history had not uh, happened yet. But we will go back into that in just a few minutes. At the bottom part of that handout, it talks about the seven churches and it talks about uh, a, what, Jesus Christ, what it says about Jesus Christ to each church then how Jesus Christ compliments each church, and then how He brings criticism on every church except for two, and then how He talks about how the problem can be corrected, or He tells them to correct it. Then He talks about the, 
the consequences if they don't correct it. And then he talks about a promise that he will give to each church that does correct it. And then he shows the time in church history that each church represents. So you have those two charts right there. Now, in each of the seven churches, when, when God begins the letter to each church, now those churches, as we said last time, those churches are located in the east, uh, the western, the western side of Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey today. So when he talks about the churches of Asia, he's not, gonna talk, not talking about the whole continent. He's not even talking about all of Asia Minor. He's talking about that little section there, the western part of Asia Minor, which is about the size of New Jersey. Now, there were more than seven churches, but God chose seven churches to get a letter from him. Those churches where they're located, I put a map in your bulletin last week. Those churches where they're located in Asia Minor, it starts with Ephesus and it goes up around, mine this way, and, and when you're looking, it goes this way. It goes up from Asia, I mean from uh, Ephesus, and it goes up and then around and then back down in the same direction as the hands of a clock. He sends letters to those churches in order of their location, which is just going from one to the next to the next to the next, but it's going also in the direction of the location, the same as the direction of the hands of a clock as the time marches on. Each church was a literal church. Each church had some, almost every church had some good things and almost every church had bad things. If you look at the characteristics of each church, those were literal churches of the time and the problems they had were at that time. But each problem going through in that church or each positive thing is a picture of church history starting with the time of the apostles going all the way around through each church until you get to Laodicea, which is a picture of the church age in which we're living now. So we're, we've already covered the first two churches. We covered Ephesus and we covered Smyrna. Ephesus was the, probably the main church that these other churches sprouted from. Apostle Paul started that church at Ephesus. Now, the meaning of the word Ephesus is, does, that means desirable. The church at Ephesus was a literal church, but the meaning of the name Ephesus is desirable. It was a church that was doing everything right. And so the Lord complimented them. And he says, I know all these different things that you're doing. However, I have one thing against you. You have left your first love. They didn't lose it. They left it. So as they begin to grow and prosper, they were obedient in so many things, all areas. And you'd look at that and you'd think, I wish our church was like that. It was like the perfect church in Ephesus. There's only one problem, he says, you have left your first love. And if you don't repent of that and start loving me, you, they quit loving Jesus. If you don't start loving me, I'm going to take away your, your lampstand, which each church he called each church a lamp stand where it held the oil lamp where they had the, that produced the light when they lit the lamp. And so the oil represent the Holy Spirit. And so each church was to be a light in the world as the Holy Spirit lived through that church. He said, if you don't repent and start loving me, I'm going to take away your lamp stand. In other words, your church is going to die. I won't be able to use you. Now in this day and age, we have churches all across America which is actually a picture of the, church, I mean, the Laodicean church. But I want to ask you today, you may be faithful in serving Jesus Christ in various areas, but do you really love Him? We have people today who, oh, they'll say, I came down, I walked down the aisle when I was 10 years old and I asked Jesus into my heart. That's great. And I know I'm going to heaven. That's great. I know my sins are forgiven. That's great. I go to church all the time. I go to youth group. I go to Christian school. Uh, I, I, do all the, I go to Bible studies. That's great. But do you love Him? Now, when I was, I went to the University of Alabama to be a doctor. I went to Southeastern in Birmingham to study for the ministry. One summer, 
I worked on staff with Wales Goebbels Ministry in Birmingham. Wales is like my spiritual daddy. We were doing evangelism all over the place, leading people to Christ, teaching Bible studies, going, going, going all the time. It was an exciting summer. And I was in the office with that one day with Wales and myself. And I was telling Wales about all these great things that were happening and stuff. And he said, Jim, let me ask you something. Do you love him? Man, that hit me like a ton of bricks. I thought, well, I'm serving him. But do I love, do you love Jesus Christ? He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Well, what about churches that are like, mega churches and everything great is happening in that church and the pastor runs off with some woman in the church and there's a scandal well god's blessing that church well that church is really active and they're doing a lot of ministry and there it's everything visible but when you stop loving jesus christ everything that you're doing outwardly is a waste of time in a sense because you're doing it for the wrong reason people can say oh Put a sign out, watch our, come watch us grow. Now, what does it mean when you put a sign out on the highway saying, come watch us grow? I'm not picking on any churches because I see those signs all the time. What it's really saying is, come watch our buildings get larger. That doesn't mean you're growing in your love for Jesus Christ. You can have buildings all over the place, but it doesn't mean you love Jesus Christ. Harvard University, Yale University, they were started to train pastors to preach the Word of God. Today they have lots of big buildings, they're famous, people come from all over the world to go to Harvard and Yale. But they're no longer, they no longer love Jesus Christ and pastors are not being trained to reach the lost world for Christ. So that church in Ephesus was a church that represented the uh, apostolic uh, church. Now, going back, I got off track here. As Jesus Christ sends a letter to each church, he addresses each church and he says, it says something about him being God. Each, when he writes a letter to each church, it starts off with some characteristic of Jesus Christ being God. We get into chapter 2 of Revelation. There we go. And so we come to the church in, in uh, Ephesus. So it says in chapter 2, it says, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand. What is that? The seven stars were the pastors of those churches. He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Those are the churches themselves. So Jesus Christ is God in that he holds those pastors in his right hand and he walks amidst those seven churches. Jesus Christ talks about himself being God. Then we go to chapter 2 over to verse 8. The next church is Smyrna. And so here, something else is mentioned about Jesus Christ being God. And it says, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Jesus Christ created the universe, and in the end, Jesus Christ will fulfill all prophecy, and then we will rule and reign with him for all eternity. So he's the first and the last who was dead and came to life. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. So here, it talks about his deity again. Then we get to the church in Pergamos in verse 12, and it says... These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Well, what is that? Well, we know that in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says the Word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So that two-edged sword is the Word of God. Jesus Christ was called the Word in John chapter 1, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Then we go over to chapter 2, verse 18. And to the angel or messenger or pastor, the word angel means angelos, is angelos in the original Greek, and it means messenger or pastor. To the pastor of the church in Thyatira, write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. 
So we saw earlier the Lord in all of His full glory in chapter 1, and now it refers back to that in the church, when he, the letter to the church in Thyatira. And He's the Son of God. Then we go over to the church in Sardis in chapter 3, verse 1, starting in the, the next uh, part of the beginning of the verse there. It says, These things says He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now we saw the seven spirits of God. We studied what those were a few weeks ago. And that's the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus Christ has the fullness of the Holy Spirit and the seven stars. He holds those pastors. Those churches had pastors and Jesus was in charge of those pastors. And then we go to the church of Philadelphia in chapter 3, verse 7. He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, and who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. Well, what does that mean? It means that Jesus Christ is in charge of those churches and He's in charge of everything. So in keeping that in mind, I'm going to go over to Isaiah chapter 9, back where we read earlier about Jesus Christ having all these names. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall rest upon His shoulder. Over here, He says, He who is holy... Uh, he who is true, he who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. So Jesus Christ has ultimate authority. Then we go from there to Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, and he says, The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulder, so he shall open and no one shall shut, and he shall shut and no one shall open. Only the king could have that authority. Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And then we go over to the church in Laodicea, and it says, These things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now what does that mean? What is the Amen? The word Amen means, in the original language, it means so be it, but it also means this is certain. This is totally true. And so Jesus Christ is someone who is totally honest, totally true. He, he, he never lies. If you want to know what the truth is, you go to Jesus Christ. He is the amen. He is the so be it. He, he is the absolute truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So as he writes to each church, he says to that last church, which is a, 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 a pretty sickening church, these things says the Amen. The faithful. Jesus Christ is always faithful to you and me. And if we grow to understand His faithfulness, the more we understand His faithfulness to us, the less we have to be afraid. Now let's take COVID for example. You can be terrified of COVID, and some people have had every right to be terrified. They've died. But when it comes to you being a Christian, nothing can touch you without His permission. Now, does that mean that you be irresponsible? I trust Jesus Christ, but I lock my car at night. I trust Jesus Christ, but I lock my house, the doors of my house at night. I trust Jesus Christ, but there's certain things that I do being responsible. However, if we go out of town and go on vacation, I don't lay awake at night thinking, I hope nobody breaks into our house and steals. <laughs> we don't have a whole lot that's valuable. I hope nobody breaks into our house and steals something. I don't worry about that. The cat, we already gave her away. Yeah, she, she bit hope. I said, uh -uh, we're not gonna have a cat that bit my wife. She didn't mean to bite her, but she just got freaked out at another cat and bit Hope instead. But anyway, I thought that's it. So I, when you belong to Jesus Christ and you are doing things to be responsible, at the same time, you can trust Him that nothing can touch you without His permission. And if it does touch you, He's already said, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called, into, are called according to His purpose. So we think, well, why do some people get martyred? 
God will use that for His glory. And sometimes we never know why, but we will when we get to heaven. So we were talking the other day, Hope and I were talking about people say, well, I'm, you need to get this shot or you need to get that or whatever. I'm going to do what I feel led to do by Jesus Christ. For me, I'm, I've made decisions for my life. And as at this point, as I've made those decisions that I believe God wants me personally to make, then I have come to the point where I'm saying, Lord, I'm going to be responsible and keep my hands washed and everything else. But I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to walk in obedience to you. And if I get sick with COVID, you, are, you have allowed it. Now, I've already gone through a time where they thought I had cancer in both my kidneys. My mom and daddy died young of cancer. You've heard me tell the story. And I was terrified when they said two different doctors, my doctor and then the urologist, said, we think you have cancer in both your kidneys. I was terrified because I had a wife and three kids at the time. That's 20 years ago. I was terrified until Jesus Christ brought that verse to my mind that says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And you've heard me say many times how I lay in that bed that night and I stretched my arms out on the mattress as if I was being crucified. And I said, Lord, I don't want to die of cancer because I saw my mom and daddy die of cancer. It was no fun. But I want to be in the center of your perfect will because your will is good, acceptable, and perfect. And if you want me to die of cancer, if you want to crucify me, crucify me. I submit to your will for my life. When I did that, and I concentrated on his faithfulness, my fear went away. And every time I became fearful, I reaffirmed, Lord, I'm going to be responsible to go to a doctor or whatever it is. However, if it's your plan for me to die of cancer, I submit to the plan. And I want as many people as possible, doctors, nurses, friends who visit me in the hospital, to see what it's like for a man to die of cancer and loving Jesus Christ at the same time. And Lord, by your grace, I will love you to the point of death. That took my fears away. If Jesus Christ could die for me, I could die for him. But however I die is his choice, not mine. And so Jesus Christ is the amen, the faithful and true witness. Jesus Christ is the true witness. We have false apostles, false teachers. We live in a day when the Bible says there are going to be many antichrists. They work against Christ, but they will say they're Christ, or they will say they're followers of Jesus Christ. You will have people who are pastors in churches today, and they talk about Jesus Christ, but their, their speech about Jesus Christ or their teaching is a little bit off base. Now, if we're pastors who are insecure, and all of us are insecure to a point because we're human, we have a sin nature. We want to see visible success. We want our peers that we went to school with to say, hey, he's doing a good job with that church. And so if we're not careful, we try to make it easy and we'll say, you're a sinner and if you want to go to heaven, you need to ask Jesus into your heart. And if you want to ask Jesus into your heart, we're going to sing a closing hymn, won't you come down to the front and we'll pray with you. And so you say, all right, now if you want to go to heaven, pray this prayer, Jesus, I know I sinned against you and I deserve to go to hell and I want you to come into my heart and be my Savior and give me eternal life. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes we make it so easy, we make people think that all you have to do is walk down the aisle and pray a prayer and you're saved. We don't say anything about the fact many times that we are sinners, we have sinned against God, and that God's wrath is upon us. And if we do not turn in repentance and to faith in Jesus Christ, 
We will be cast one day into the lake of fire and we'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. And God's wrath will be upon us because we have rejected what Jesus Christ did on the cross when he was shedding his blood and he took the punishment for our sins as if he was the guilty party. And he rose again from the dead three days later. So you have all these religions in the world. Well, Oprah Winfrey said there's more than one way to get to heaven. She's, a, she's full of baloney. Because all those other religions, if they teach an afterlife, they're teaching that you can do something to earn it. You can't earn it. Jesus Christ earned it. He's the only one. When he died on the cross, he shed his blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. The life is in the blood. And so Jesus Christ shed his blood for you and me. And then if they had smothered him to death, if they'd hung him, if they choked him to death, we couldn't be forgiven. His blood had to be shed. And three days, and it, then as he died, he says, Father, it is finished. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. I've paid for their sins. Now it's time to come home. He died, and three days later, he rose again from the dead. So he writes to each of these seven churches. And before each church, he's letting them know, I'm God. Now, I've already gone through my introduction, and it's time to quit. So, so we're going to be going into, from, chap, from the second church, we're going to be going into the third church, which is Pergamos. Now, Pergam, I'm going to read through that, make a few comments, and then we'll be done. To the angel or messenger of the church in Pergamos, write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword, the Word of God. I know your works, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Now, we'll talk about Satan's throne next week. They were living in the midst of satanic worship in that, in that city. You hold fast to my name, you're faithful. And did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, were, where Satan dwells. Some theologians believe that was the pastor of the church who got martyred. Maybe they got another one after that. But he dwelt among them, whoever he was. They all knew him, and he died for Christ. But I have a few things against you, because you have those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. And Balak brought in a bunch of Moabite women who seduced the Israel, is, Israeli, the Jewish men. They intermarried with them and they got into all kinds of terrible worship and they got into all kinds of sensual, they'd have sensual uh, immoral feasts and things like that. So he says, Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And we talked about that last week, and we'll go into more detail next week. Which thing I hate. Nicholas was a person that we will see next week that uh, turned, or his followers turned from Christ and began to teach things that allowed people to live and have sexual, a sexual immoral religion. Repent or else I will come quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He says, if you don't straighten out the mess in your church, I'm going to come and straighten it out myself. And I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone's name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Now that's something that's exciting to me. He's talking about that white stone. They gave that to the guys who won the race in the, in the Olympics. And then he would be able to enter into the, the victor's circle. But then he says, and on that stone, it'll be written something that no one knows except the person who receives it. God's going to write you a personal note on that white stone. We don't even know what it is. Nobody will know except you and, and the Lord. Now, he's saying in this church, if you don't deal with this sin in your church, I'm going to come and deal with it. So next week we will come back and we will start with Pergamos and we'll try to go through a couple other churches. I don't want to spend forever in these churches, but there's some good stuff in here that we need to realize. Keep in mind one more thing. At the end of each letter to each church, as it gets to the bottom of the letter, he says, 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He says that at the end of every letter. So what he's saying is, is as, as you read the letter to this church, and this church, and this church, and this church, he says, those who read this letter, I want you to hear what I'm saying. That applies to us. So as we read this to the letter to this church in Pergamos, God's saying to us, if you have an ear to hear, you listen to what I'm saying too. Because there are churches today who have immoral people in those churches and they do not deal with the immorality. I'm going to give you an illustration of, of how people respond to immorality today. And I'll talk about it more in depth next week. A lot of people feel like sex between two people who love each other is okay. Sex is not okay except between a husband and wife. It's not okay to have sex when you're engaged. It's not okay to have sex when you're going steady. It's not okay to have sex just for the fun of it. That is for a husband and a wife. Our society has become so perverted that nobody thinks about that. Well, everybody else doesn't gets away with it. No, they haven't gotten away with it. They just think that they have. The divorce rate is terrible. And children today are having terrible times growing up because the family is so goofy. If you have an immoral relationship, then you get married to the person. You've already created a cloud of guilt between you and God. And you can, you, it's almost impossible to have true intimacy, to, true spiritual intimacy between you and the Lord, you and your spouse and the Lord, because you've already violated the relationship that you're supposed to have as husband and wife. And so you have in the news today this young girl and her boyfriend traveling around. They were engaged or something. Oh, they're traveling around all the, way, all the way to the Grand Tetons, and now she's missing, and he's come back home to Florida, and he won't tell anybody what happened to her. But here they are. They're not married, but they got a van, and they ride around, and I'm sure they're having sex together all the time, and nobody thinks anything about it. It's okay. It's perfectly acceptable to let your daughter and her boyfriend get into a van and travel across America for months and months, and that's okay. The parents are not upset about it. They're not worried about that. And then we have parents today, and I hope you're not guilty of, of this, who were so foolish that they will give their college student a credit card during spring break, and they'll say, here's a credit card, you go down there for a week during spring break and have a good time. That's the dumbest thing you can ever do. I went to college, I went to the University of Alabama, and it was nothing like it is today. But for parents to say, here's the credit card, here's the car, the, or if they haven't already bought them a brand new car, go down there and have a good time on spring break. Kids will be kids, boys will be boys, girls will be go girls. Now you're sending your kids off to an orgy. I've lived here for 35 years, I know what goes on at spring break. You see girls out there drunk, the guys put a funnel in their mouth, they're pouring liquor, beer down there. Chug, lug, 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 and they're just getting plastered. This kind of stuff is going on in the church. And Jesus Christ said, if you don't deal with it, he says, I'll deal with it. Sex is fun. Sin is fun. But God chastens those whom he loves. And so God says, if you don't repent of your sin, I will, make greater, I will bring greater pain into your life than the pleasure of sin that's in your life. The pain will outweigh the pleasure. So we have people today who get married and then sometime later they're getting divorced because the sex is not what they thought it was going to be because you can't build a marriage on just sex. But it sure gets people's attention when they're single and some people who are married. The husband-wife relationship is supposed to be a picture of Jesus Christ and His church. Satan wants to destroy that. It was happening in this church. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank You for this wonderful day. And Lord, we know that we live in a society that is corrupt. Very few people are honest. Very few politicians can be trusted. Lord, we live in a day that we don't know who we can trust. 
We watch the world around us and they're floundering. They appear to be getting away with sin. And then some people blow their heads off or some people just overdose or whatever it is or they just they can't stay together and they go from spouse to spouse to spouse or they just shack up and live together and the kids are all confused and they're taking Ritalin. Lord, we just live in a rough place. And Lord, we thank you that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through you, Lord. Thank you for the fact that you're totally holy and righteous and pure and just. And you do not compromise with sin, but you do love those who repent and trust Christ as their Savior. And you lift us up to be children of the King. We thank you for that. If anyone here has never trusted Christ, I pray that they would today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.